A faltering national currency and the slowest economic growth in four years. These worrying factors are fueling fears over the state of South Korea's economy. Monday, Seoul unveiled a stimulus plan for 2009, including tax cuts and new government spending worth about $11 billion. One of the goals is to throw small business owners a lifeline. Song Jie has more on how they're coping in these hard times. These days, Oh doesn't need a cup of joe to keep him up at nights. All he has to do is think of how to keep his once fast-growing chain of organic coffee shops profitable. O's customers sip their coffee for the same price they did in May. But O's cost of importing freshly roasted coffee beans have jumped at least 20% due to the exchange rate alone. Yeah, I think the intensity of the, the knot in the stomach has increased somewhat in the last year. O knew trouble was brewing and oil prices skyrocketed at the beginning of the year. But when the Korean won plummeted against the U.S. dollar, he knew he had to drastically cut costs in order to survive. He's already found a local producer for his previously U.S.-made paper cups, and now he's looking to roast his coffee beans in Korea. O's coffee shop dilemma is just a microscopic example of why Korean companies across the board have been hit harder than those in most other countries. The stock market losing over 40% of its value since the beginning of the year. The U.S. dollar's gains against the Korean won started earlier this year, then skyrocketed when the global financial crisis hit and everyone was scrambling for dollars, raising fears about Korean banks falling victims. Some point the finger at poor judgment by a new government that wanted to stimulate exports by weakening the Korean won and making Korean products cheaper abroad. Then couldn't control the free fall. From the time that the situation spread all over the world globally, the, the, uh, the Korean economic team responded lately, inappropriately, inconsistently, and sometimes against the market with a wrong belief that they can control the market. From the president on down, government officials assure the domestic and international markets that with foreign currency reserves of some $240 billion, Korea was strong enough to ride out the crisis. The Korean government will pour sufficient and preemptive cash into the market until the uncertainty is overcome. And it was only when the government announced a $30 billion currency swap line with the U.S. Federal Reserve in late October that the market seemed to calm down and fears eased. Nevertheless, the market has been hit hard and the government is introducing measures to stimulate domestic demand. But entrepreneurs like O can't wait. We can't sit around. Before it was, in the beginning it was panic, I think, with consumers and even our, our staff. But now I think it's more of a crisis mode where they see that it's something that we have to work our way through. Luckily, Yo says he hasn't seen sales drop. He says while Koreans may not shop, they still need their cup of joe. Sun Jie, CNN, Seoul. Another sign of rising tensions on the Korean peninsula. The North Korean state-run news agency says the military is shutting its land border with South Korea next month. And the Associated Press reports that South Korea is prepared to send its official response. Relations between Seoul and Pyongyang have deteriorated since the conservative South Korean president took office in February. Lee Moon-bok pledged to be tough with North Korea. There's some respite at last for thousands of innocent civilians caught up in Congo's fighting. Hungry and homeless people took advantage of a UN aid shipment deep in rebel-held territory. It's the first such delivery there since the current fighting began last month. The World Food Programme says some 50,000 civilians in the area north of Goma will benefit from the aid delivery.
a former political prisoner has been sworn in as a new president of the Maldives. Mohamed Nasheed, a longtime dissident, defeated Asia's longest serving ruler in the island's nation's first multi party elections. Mr. Nasheed had been a fierce critic of former President Mamoun Abdul Gayoom, who ruled the Maldives for 30 years. The nation is a popular spot for Western tourists, but is also dealing with unemployment, crime, drugs, and corruption. Ireland has wrapped up its investigation of an emergency landing of an Air Canada flight in January at Shannon Airport. Investigators say the co-pilot suffered a mental breakdown in mid-flight and had to be forcibly removed from the cockpit, then sedated and restrained. And get this, it was a flight attendant with flying skills who stepped into the cockpit to help the pilot make a safe landing. None of the nearly 150 passengers were injured on the Toronto to London flight. One of the greatest players in the history of football celebrates a landmark day. Diego Maradona will be on the bench for the first time as Argentina's national coach. He retired as a player a long time ago and as a history of drug abuse and weight problems has been widely publicized. But the compact Argentinian is hoping for a debut win against Scotland. Reading the front page over a cup of coffee might be headed in a digital direction. On um, this week's Eco Solutions, Fred Plankin shows us how engineers are putting a new twist on the morning paper and how this new gadget might help save trees around the world. Four billion. That's an estimate of how many trees are cut down every year to make paper products. Gentlemen, put down your chainsaws because the Plastic Logic e-reader is almost here. The device is kind of very thin, very light. Um, it is about the size and weight of a pad of paper. Due out next year, the e-reader says so long to all those piles of paper. It works by taking uh, anything that you would normally print out uh, or read on paper, like a newspaper or a magazine, and transfers them from either computer or wirelessly you know, to the device so that you can read them. At this one-of-a-kind production facility in Dresden, Germany, Nanotech is saving Mother Nature where an environmentally friendly process creates the e-paper's unique flexible plastic design. And with the swipe of a thumb, Plastic Logic hopes to usher in a green reading revolution. No more cutting down trees, um, mass production of paper, uh, no big printing presses, and of course no big trucks distributing the paper. An estimated 1.7 billion people read one of these every day. If Plastic Logic has its way, selling a few e-readers might just save a few of these. Fred Pleitkin, CNN, Berlin. The promise of a new puppy at the White House, as Barack Obama's daughters thrilled, of course, but not just them. Many people across the nation are also eagerly anticipating its arrival. Ginny Mose has some solutions for those who can't stand the suspense. Who needs a first dog when you can watch six puppies? <coughs> and who wants to be a dog in the White House anyway? Even the high brown New Yorker is imagining a dog's life among politicos. Blathering about the Middle East, and one of them turns to me and says, And what do you think, Barney? What do you think we should do? And all I could come up with was... Whoop! I felt like such an ass. There's even the Obama dog blog featuring a cartoon showing the first dog lifting his leg on a house plant while President Obama says, no you can't. And we can't leave out the latest jingle, Howl to the Chief. But now the Obamas say they're going to hold off on getting a puppy till they've settled in. Now, if we're going to have to wait for months for this White House dog, we need a puppy fix right now. And here it is, Puppy Nanny Cam. <laughs> a San Francisco couple set up a webcam. So the family wanted a way to be able to check in on the puppies while they're at work. Just 
They used a free service called Ustream TV that lets you stream live video over the internet. Now millions have watched the puppies scratch, lick, and wipe out on the wee wee pads. New unemployment claims in the U.S. have reached a 16-year high. And for a growing number of people, that means it's getting harder and harder to put food on the table. Many are turning to food banks to feed their families, but as Thelma Gutierrez reports, some fear even that source could run out. <laughs> Early morning at the Mend Food Bank in Pacoima, California. Only one line, okay? The lines begin to form before the doors even open. Every week we seem to be breaking new records as far as the number of people served. It's the same concern at food banks across the country. Yes, there will be a hard time coming. You don't have to look far to find people who recently had a turn to charity to feed their families. I never thought I'd be in this position that we're in now. I never thought that things would get this bad. The downslide happened fast for Greg and Cheryl Guthrie and their three kids. Six months ago, Greg was laid off as a forklift operator. When his unemployment benefits ran out, the Guthries had to live off of Cheryl's disability check. The map tells the whole story. She gets $1,600 a month. Their rent is $1,350. That leaves the family $250 for fuel, food, and everything else. It's an humbling experience being a man going in there, you know, saying I really need help. My family can't stand right now. Judy Cox had to leave her job working in a prison kitchen to care for her sick mother. Now the family's finances are collapsing, and it's taking a toll on her daughter. This is really, really hard. I shed so many tears. It's, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. With more than 10 million Americans now out of work and companies struggling in the economy, experts say food banks may have a tougher time finding donors. And given what has happened with our economy uh, over the past 8 to 10 weeks, uh, there are some challenges ahead. Regional food banks like Second Harvest in San Bernardino say corporate donations haven't stopped yet. They now feed 250,000 people a month. But that number is going up, so there may be less food to go around. For now, Greg Guthrie gives thanks for the help he's receiving. Thelma Gutierrez, CNN, San Bernardino, California. In medical news, an incredible breakthrough has one woman breathing a great deal easier. Her doctors were able to grow her a new windpipe after hers sustained terrible damage. Here's CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta reporting on how they did it. Behind every medical breakthrough, there is a story, and you're looking at one. 30-year-old Claudia Castillo playing with her kids. She is proof that stem cells can make a difference. Just a few months ago, a scene like this would have been impossible. Her lungs and trachea were badly damaged by a terrible bout with tuberculosis. Look here, critical narrowings, not enough air getting into her lungs. So her doctors decided to build her a new airway using adult stem cells taken from her bone marrow, not from the embryonic stem cells that caused so much controversy. It has never been done before in a human. The jump between uh, the animal investigation and the human investigation was a big sort of mystery to me as well but we succeeded pictures tell it best take a look at this doctors took a donor trachea from a 51 year old who had died for six weeks they methodically stripped away all the cells leaving just a matrix or scaffolding then slowly they began to build up a new trachea using claudia stem cells and cells from a healthy part of her trachea the transplant was next rare shots inside the operating room Four days after her transplant, doctors say Claudia's windpipe was almost indistinguishable from a healthy patient's. Today, she has no complications and no signs of rejecting the transplanted tissue. It's a long process, but four months after they operated on me, it's much better. I'm fine now. Doctors say they hope their success will open doors for future transplants to be performed and to help even more patients like Claudia return to normal lives. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN, New York.
The U.S. government promised $700 billion to fix the ailing economy, but apparently that wasn't enough. On Tuesday, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson revealed two new programs that will provide another $800 billion aimed at getting consumers to start spending once more. Paulson says the crisis is so deep that no single measure can fix it. The U.S. Justice Department says three major electronics manufacturers will pay $585 million in fines for their roles in price fixing. At issue, the prices of LCD display panels. The department announced the plea agreement after a settlement with Japan's Sharp Corporation, South Korea's LG Display Company, and Taiwan's Chunghua Picture Tubes. as markets around the world fight for stability. It's hard to forget that the troubles began with Wall Street. Maggie Lake has a look at how things got so bad so fast. The current financial crisis has its roots in the U.S. In 2007, the U.S. housing bubble burst. Some consumers now found their mortgage payments increasing while the value of their home was declining. They began to fall behind on payments. Foreclosures began to rise. Early in 2008, things went from bad to worse. What began as a housing problem morphed into a full-blown financial crisis as institutions that were exposed to risky mortgage-backed investments began teetering. In March, the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve orchestrated the fire sale of Bear Stearns to J.P. Morgan Chase. Once we started to lose Bear Stearns and these institutions started to drop like flies, the train had left the station. At that point, it was going to run its course. And as um, the evidence mounted that there was a full-blown recession, not only in the U.S., but globally, uh, the panic really set in. The panic shook the global financial system to its core. In the span of less than two weeks in September, the U.S. government took over mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Lehman Brothers collapsed, filing the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. Merrill Lynch sold itself to Bank of America to avoid a similar fate. And the U.S. government bailed out insurance giant American International Group, which was on the verge of failure because of its exposure to exotic securities. Outside the U.S., the U.K. moved to nationalize troubled mortgage giant Bradford and Bingley. And Dutch-Belgian bank Fortis was bailed out. It's happened to different degrees all around the world. Basically, there was a lot of liquidity. Uh, globally uh, that inflated home prices and then Wall Street or uh, London or Tokyo uh, investors all figured out ways to leverage up on that move. The credit crisis intensified amid a massive crisis of confidence. Banks unwilling to lend to each other and to their customers. Global stock markets plunged and the U.S. Treasury turned to Congress for emergency help. After a contentious debate, Congress okayed a massive $700 billion financial rescue plan in October. European governments quickly moved on their own rescue plans, and central banks around the world moved to slash interest rates. Maggie Lake, CNN, New York. Now, U.S. automakers may be shrinking at home, but there's one market where, while they're uh, still going flat out for growth, the China International Auto Show opens on Wednesday, an important platform for automakers from around the world, hoping for a piece of a fast-moving car market. Emily Chang reports on the road ahead for one U.S. car maker in China. At one of Beijing's biggest car markets, rows and rows of gleaming automobiles, just waiting for a test drive. Feng Chong Wei is shopping for his first car. This is GM's Buick Excel. With the economic crisis, car sellers are under great pressure, so we can get better discounts, says Feng. The pressure is so great, GM has warned it could collapse. So, if the U.S. government bails out GM, it will be saving a company that's relying on business from China to survive. China is the largest auto market outside the United States for GM and is the most profitable auto market for GM. GM broke into the China market early. It's now considered the most prestigious U.S. auto brand here and employs about 20,000 Chinese workers. 
Even on the verge of bankruptcy, GM wants to expand in China. Its sales in the U.S. may be falling, but here they're rising. In fact, some say China could speed past the U.S. as the world's largest car market in a matter of years. Automakers expect to sell a million more cars in China this year compared to last year, and about two and a half million less in the U.S. However, drivers in China are hitting the brakes too. Car sales slowed for the first time in three years in August during the Olympics because of rising gas prices and restrictions on car use in Beijing to limit pollution. Business is better now, but still slow. The car market in China has been influenced by the world economy, but in a big city like Beijing, thousands of cars are still being bought. Dealers here expect a boom in sales ahead of the Chinese New Year. Good tidings for GM, if GM, as the world knows it, survives. Emily Chang, CNN, Beijing. How has your education prepared you for this job? I've learned a great deal of knowledge by taking classes in this field in college. On top of that, I acquired hands-on experience through my internship program during my college days. Good. The last question for you. Why should we hire you? The reason is because I believe that I'm the best person for this job. I'm sure other applicants also have the ability to do this job. However, I believe my enthusiasm is second to none. Also, my flexibility to adapt to various needs and situations keeps me apart from other applicants. Okay, that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you. I look forward to hearing from you. I'd like you to meet our newcomer, Ms. Sohyun Park. Please give her a round of applause. Good evening. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm really excited to work with all of you. Actually, I've spent some time talking to Sohyun, and she seems like a very talented, down-to-earth, friendly person. She will make a good co-worker. I'm so flattered. I'll do my best to be a good team player. Please help me out until I get settled. Don't worry about it. You're in good hands. Now, Let's make a toast to our success. Hello, I'm Andrew Stevens in New Delhi. I'm with the man who's at the forefront of the country's IT revolution. He's known as the Bill Gates of India, the software entrepreneur Nandan Nilakani. This is Talk Asia. This is the nerve center of one of India's most high-profile companies. Infosys is an IT and outsourcing giant with revenues of $4 billion, a workforce of almost 100,000 people. It works in diverse sectors from hospitality to banking to aerospace, and its meteoric growth tracks the rise of India as an economic tiger. It's all a long way from the humble beginnings of Infosys back in 1981 when seven partners launched the company from this office with just $250. These days, the firm is led by this man, co-founder Nandan Nilakani. He helped lead Infosys to its listing on the NASDAQ, the first by an Indian IT company. And his prevailing ethos on levelling the playing field inspired Thomas Friedman's bestseller, The World is Flat. Nandan Nilakani, thanks so much for joining us here at Talk Asia. Now, we just heard that the, the world is flat, the Tom Friedman book, and I guess if you take an economic perspective on this, the world is actually going rapidly downhill. What do you think the impact is going to be of this 
impending global recession on India? Well, I think India is certainly going to be impacted. I think uh, we had several years of uh, fantastic economic growth growing at 8-9%. I think that will definitely slow down. I think uh, our companies and our consumers are facing liquidity crunch, which is related to this global issue. So I think we are going to be impacted. At the same time, I think the fundamentals of India, our young population, our, our entrepreneurs, our high savings rate, I think those are very much in place. So I think as soon as things stabilize, I think India will get back on the growth curve. Well, the Indian Finance Minister says all India needs is a little bit of confidence and it can have 9% growth in 2009. Do you buy that? Uh, that, you know, I'm not a soothsayer on that. But fundamentally, as I said, the combination of demographic savings, uh, the entrepreneurs and our global advantages has absolutely got the potential for in India to grow at 9% in the long term. I want to bring the impact of outsourcing close to home to India now. Um, it is a young person's industry. Infosys, for example, has, what, 100,000 employees. The average age is 26 years old. They have a much higher disposable income, which leads to higher economic independence, social independence than perhaps their parents did. Absolutely. Do you think the outsourcing industry is changing Indian culture? Well, I think certainly it's having an impact. Of course, the number of people in the industry may be a couple of million, which in a population of a billion is, is not much. But they are younger, they are much more globalized, they are, they are more free spending, they, you know, they, uh, they, they buy things, they go to malls. At the same time, you will know, be amazed, but I'm finding a lot of these youngsters are very socially conscious and I want to do something for the society. Back in 1981, did you have any idea, any inkling that you were onto something which would become this big? We had no idea. I don't think we realized, it certainly I didn't, I was just 25 at that time and I didn't really realize the import of what we were doing. But one thing was that all of us had such uh, total faith in Narayan Murthy that we would follow him. If he said, jump off this cliff, we would have probably done that too. So we had complete faith in his leadership and we said this is a great person and a great leader. What were you going to? What did you think you were going to though with emphasis? No, it was very clear that uh, you know we, we knew there was going to be a global opportunity in software. We knew that India was going to be a huge uh, talent pool. And we felt there was a need to create a world-class, professional, ethical company which could really marry these two things. So that was very clear right from day one. Do you have any one or two rules you think have made a huge difference to you and your business success? So one is that I, I believe in being less busy and more effective. I believe in being generous with my money and stingy with my time. You know, these are s s and simple uh, principles. And I believe that I, can, I, I should have a portfolio of ideas I work with, each of them with great people, and I know some will win and some won't, but push on all fronts. It's a pleasure to welcome her back to Larry King Live, Judge Judy. By the way, Judge Judy has a new DVD out. I'm holding it up. Judge Judy, second to none. There you see its cover. She presides over the top-rated, Emmy-nominated reality TV court show that bears her name, Judge Judy. Okay, what obvious? What's your reaction to the Obama election? It's exciting to be alive during that kind of political race, isn't it? I mean, you don't remember a race that was that exciting, I think, None. since probably the 60s. Were you surprised? No. I don't think anybody was surprised. You and I spoke about uh, this election well over a year ago. And I think you asked me the question, what did you think? And it was shortly after the time that uh, President-elect had announced his candidacy. And I think I said to you that Jerry and I were in, on the treadmills together in Florida. And we listened to it, and it was the first time in a very long time that I got goosebumps on my back. What do you make of the first lady to be? I think she's dynamite. I think she's smart, and I think that she's intellectually equipped for the job, which is a big job, and I think she knows her man, she knows all of his strengths, and she knows where he's got some clay in his feet, and she's prepared to prop him up and to tell him, to give him a poke if she says something that when it, that's out of line and say to him, shh, you know, quiet. Shh. Judge Judy presided over the marriage of Michael Feinstein, the noted cabaret entertainer, who's starring now in a Christmas show in New York, 
when he married his longtime love interest, and they are a gay couple, and uh, there was a proposition on the ballot in California that would cancel what was uh, placed in by the Supreme Court that gays could get married, and that proposition passed. So that, in, a, in essence, threw out gay marriages. First, those who are married, are they okay? I believe they are. I, mean, I don't see a scenario. About 18,000. I don't see any scenario under which this proposition, which modified the Constitution of the state of California and said that a marriage is only man between a, a man and a woman, I don't think that you can ex post facto void the marriages that took place when the law was, when it was good. Man. Well, I was, of course, saddened by the vote. I was as saddened by the vote here in California as I was in the state of Arkansas, which was, which w was equally an affront to both common sense and what I know in my role as an old family court judge for 25 years is not in the best interest of children. Because in the state of Arkansas, they said that no same-sex couple could adopt a child or foster parent a child. They didn't say that here, right? No, they didn't say that here, but they said that in the state of Arkansas. And while they didn't specifically refer to gay couples, clearly it was a, it was uh, directed towards gay couples, and I know so many wonderful couples, same-sex couples, who are wonderful parents and wonderful foster parents to children. And why would you allow a child to remain in a foster care situation when there are loving people prepared to offer them a home? I don't get it. We only have 30 seconds left. How long are you going to keep on doing this? Uh, I don't know. Until they make me go into high definition, I guess. How long are you contracted <laughs> uh, Till 2013. It's nice. Enough. Yeah, it's nice. 2013 is, is a long time. You're an amazing lady. Thank you. You oh. too. Build it and they will come. Make it different and they'll come in droves. Sheldon Adelson's career is pretty much based on that mantra, a philosophy that he tells us can be adapted to just about any business. The founder of the Las Vegas Sands Group is now among the 10 richest men in the world, estimated worth $26 billion. The boardroom caught up with Adelson there and asked what keeps driving him forward. Why do mountain climbers climb big mountains? Well, I mean, I've been in business 62 years, and I've created over 50 different businesses. You know, I mean, each business I want to create, I want to do something more unique. I want to do something more novel. And I want to do something uh, as a greater achievement. Uh, being an entrepreneur is kind of like being a performer. You want to, you want to go out and perform whatever you do, sing, dance, act, whatever. And then uh, you hear the applause, then the applause eventually dies down, and then you say, oh, I like that applause, I want to hear some more. So you go out and do something again, and then you get some more applause. Now, the applause doesn't have to be in the sound and from an audience, it could be in your own mind. That if you're satisfied with what you've done, what else can you do that's, that's more impressive to yourself? Could you describe your business matrix to CNN? I know nobody will believe me, and nobody will even try it. But I have no other answer except this, and I am 1,000% convinced of this. You have to challenge the status quo. You have to change the status quo. And if you change the status quo of any business, success will follow you like your shadow. Could you be a successful farmer? Sure. Why not? I mean, what is there to know? The, the the product or the service changes, but not the fundamental business model. So why do so many people fail at it then? The thing that I see a lot of people fail is, number one, they do things the way that everybody does it. So that you throw yourself into a potpourri of sameness, of oneness. People have to be more adventurous, and they've got to try things somewhat differently. Do you have a technique, do you employ a technique perhaps that is unique to you in driving your own business development and the people around you? There's a big difference between management and leadership. 
management is a given authority. Leadership is an earned authority. If what I have found over the years that people have come back to me and in businesses that I've ever sold or dissolved or whatever, people will come back and say, you know, things weren't as good as when I was working for you. There was always electricity in the air. There was always excitement. Katrina destroyed families, homes. We were a normal red-blooded America family. And one day, it took to wipe us out. I was so beaten down, that I was going to blow myself away. When Katrina hit, I was living in Washington, D.C. I couldn't believe the pictures that I was looking at. I wanted to come down to New Orleans and volunteer. I naively thought that six months later, you'd see all kinds of progress. But St. Bernard Parish looked like the storm had just rolled through. We realized very quickly that we were going to move to New Orleans. It was just something that we felt like we had to do. I'm Liz McCartney, and I'm helping families rebuild in St. Bernard Parish. The St. Bernard Project can take a house that was gutted down to the studs, hang the sheetrock, put in new floors. We do all of that work in about 12 weeks for about $12,000. The St. Bernard Project, Liz and Hug Group, they saved my life. Once you get one family back, other families are more confident and they're willing to come back as well. Little by little, one house at a time, we'll be back. I feel it, I know it. Well, the charges were the latest in a long time or long line of scandals that have plagued Michael Jackson in recent years. And behind the sensation is a very troubled past. One London musical is attempting to shed light on this past and revive the golden years of the king of pop. Alfonso Van Marsh has the behind the scenes report. Could this be London theater's next king of pop? Child actors trying to stand out in a crowd, braving the cold for a chance to play young Michael Jackson on stage. It's Michael Jackson, my inspiration, and I'll do anything, anything to be on that stage, performing live, singing his songs. Ooh, baby, Thriller Live is billed as a musical rock and roll crossover featuring the songs of the Jackson 5 and Michael Jackson. With us looking for a young talent, you know, it's, it's, it's that raw quality that we want so that we can nurture it into the Michael Jackson qualities. And raw, some of them certainly are. been years since Jackson had a number one hit, but if shows like Mamma Mia can bring in legions of ABBA fans, so too can Thriller Live, or so says the kid who starred in an earlier version of the show. When we were in Germany, for example, they went crazy, they were screaming from the beginning to end, so like even when I hadn't even sung, they'd be woo woo. And, and while nervous parents look on, some kids get the callback pass they wanted. Others don't. These aspiring Michael Jacksons may be disappointed to learn that the king of pop himself is not involved with this project, but Sony, which owns much of Michael Jackson's musical backlog, is supporting the musical. A musical, if successful, could help the public remember a time when the troubled pop star was known only for his hits. Alfonso Van Marsh, CNN, London.
Well, how's this for a challenge? Hot air balloonists from around the world have been gathering in southwestern Japan for a rather unusual contest. They're trying to see how accurately they can drop weights onto targets on the ground. More than a hundred of these colourful balloons from 14 countries are expected to take part in this year's festival. Now, it may look like a ball, but uh, I can tell you this is no piece of sports equipment. It is the first live sighting of a pygmy tarsier in more than 80 years. Now, many scientists thought this tiny, wide-eyed primate was extinct. That is a hand that is holding it. You can just see at the top of the screen, uh, three of these little tarsiers were found recently on Indonesia's Sulawesi Island by an expedition that had set out specifically to find them. Fireworks, celebrities, and more luxury than you might be able to imagine is happening in Dubai, where developers are staging a $20 million extravagant extravaganza to mark the official launch of a giant hotel and resort called the Atlantis the Palm. It's built on a man-made island shaped like a palm tree. The island has increased Dubai's shoreline by 100%. Among those scheduled to be on hand for the three-day opening celebrations include Kylie Minogue, the Duchess of York, Oprah Winfrey, Robert De Niro, and Bollywood star Priyanka Chopra. There you are. You can get yourself one of those Rolls Royces. They look great, don't they? Looks like the sort of thing that a, uh, a rock star might uh, drive or a movie director. Speaking of which, it looks like Madonna and Guy Ritchie are on the fast track now to getting their divorce approved. Their names have been listed on London's High Court schedule for Friday. It says a judge will grant them a preliminary divorce decree. What a weekend across uh, Europe. We've seen snow all over the place, including in the United Kingdom. This shot here, the snow plows out in Whitby, which is in the northeast of England. So will that snow be ending anytime soon? Well, certainly not for the northeast today. We've still got that area of low pressure, weakening a little bit. But I think if you're in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, northwestern Russia, the wind and the snow will be continuing. And after a rough weekend across central parts of the continent, we'll still be dealing with a little bit more snow on Monday. But it's all rain out to the west, and some of that rain very heavy, particularly in central Italy. We'll see certainly some heavy rain affecting Rome.